In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle them the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, by the light of the Holy Ghost, as instructed the hearts of thy faithful. Grant us, by the same Spirit, to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, <coughs> Saint William, <coughs> Saint Anthony, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. In the retreats we have sometimes the instructions. This is an instruction. And I'd like to speak about something very, very important for all of us. And that is the something that blessed Elizabeth of the Holy Trinity. She was a, a holy nun who lived in the 20s and 30s. And she had a great devotion to the indwelling of the Holy Trinity in our soul. The indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in our soul. <laughs> so this indwelling <clears throat> means literally God living in our soul, which is poured into the soul at baptism, <clears throat> where sanctifying grace is poured into the soul, into a little baby, it's packed with the Holy Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, by grace. It's packed with the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, the twelve fruits of the Holy Ghost, the three theological virtues, the four moral virtues, the Beatitudes. It's all packed into that little soul of a baby, which comes with the, with the presence of the Holy Trinity in the soul. St. Paul says, don't you know you are temples of the Holy Ghost, and that the Holy Ghost dwells in thee. And this is the true dignity of man. All this talk at Vatican II of the dignity of man. Without me, you're not dignified, Christ says. Without me, you can do nothing. So the true dignity is us submitting to believe all that God has revealed by believing the Catholic faith and participating in the very life of God and obeying his commandments. So, without that, well, there's no real human dignity. And that's why Vatican II is such a crime and such an ass assault on our Catholic faith, because they put all the dignity of man just because he's a man. <clears throat> but man fallen is a slave to the devil by original sin, and by personal sin, certainly mortal sin. So one loses his dignity and is worth nothing but to be thrown to the fires of hell. So what dignity is that? So all this talk of human dignity in the new mass, all this man-centeredness, is all a bunch of man-worship, an, an offensive to God. So the true doctrine, in Latin, sanctifying grace, is called gratia gratis faciens, which means, literally, grace making the soul beautiful. Grace making the soul beautiful and freely given by God. It's a total free gift. Gratis means freely given. And that means that when a, a soul lives in the state of grace, they really are participating in the very life of God himself. There's four effects, we'll cover this shortly, but the first effect is participation in the very life of the Holy Trinity. So in a way we could say it's like a blood transfusion <clears throat> of Christ's most precious blood put into our veins and we share in his life of the, of the most Holy Trinity. It's, it's unbelievable this dignity, this gift that God gives to us. If we recognize the dignity, the true heights that God brings us to, 
we'd get dizzy because this is his, this is his love. See, love seeks union. Love is defined by St. Thomas Aquinas as charity or love is to seek the good of the other for the good of the other that's true love for many people they'll love someone but for the good that I get from him or her it's a selfish interest but true love is to seek the good of the other for the good of the other. And mothers are just shining examples of this, how much they pour out self-sacrifice, self-denial. <coughs> they give themselves continually to raising their children and the house chores. It's a big job. Who would want any other career than being a good mother other than being a consecrated nun married to Christ? But it's a constant self-giving. That's why St. Paul says the, the mother will be saved by childbearing. Because taking all the children God sends, it's a constant sacrifice. The, the labor pains. And then in the, uh, in the Ukraine, there's a saying from my ancestors. And they said, when they're babies, they drink your milk. When they're children, they eat your food, and when they're older, they eat your heart. And all the, that's why it's so painful when children become rebellious, because you gave everything for them. You changed their diapers, you nursed them, you healed their wounds, you fed them. You, and when you get slapped for it, it's, it's, it's a quite a, it's quite a painful Rebellion. But even then, we must pray for them and seek their good. So, the perfect charity, God is charity, is He has done this in the, in the most perfect degree. Because by creating us and the angels, God doesn't get any benefit. There's no perks for Him. And giving us free will, all we've done, most of us, is just insult Him and offend Him and crucify Him. But even then, even then, God's love truly seeks the good of the other, the good of souls, for the good of the other. So here on earth, he gives us to share in his divine life by sanctifying grace, to profess all that he believed, which is an extraordinary grace. To profess the true Catholic faith is an extraordinary grace. How often Archbishop Lefebvre used to say, tell the faithful that we are fighting the fight against liberalism that goes way back to the, to the Protestant and French Revolution, and how Pius IX, with the syllabus of errors, condemned the modern errors, and St. Pius X condemned all the modernist errors. And we're in that same battle. But in the days of Pius IX, the liberals were a handful, and most clergy and people were traditional Catholic. They fought liberalism. They didn't want it. They believed in the union of church and state. They believed in the reign of Christ the King. But now it's the exact opposite. The, the faithful Catholics, faithful to, truly faithful to tradition, are, are few, and most are liberals. And Pius IX said that the biggest enemies of the church are not so much the atheists and the communists and the socialists and even Satanists, but it's liberal Catholics. That is, liberal Catholics, today liberal Catholics would be defined as those who in any way accept Vatican II and the new Mass and try to justify it in the new Code of Canon Law. And you cannot justify these crimes against our holy Catholic faith that Vatican II is. That would be an in-depth study of the, of the actual documents. Some, maybe some year we'll go deeper into that. But, so, sanctifying grace... What is it? 
it's defined as, in our catechism, it's very simple. God living in our soul. That's how it's defined in the, the old catechism. God living in our soul. So what does that really mean? When our Lord said, I am the vine and you are the branches, if you cut off a branch, it no longer shares in the sap. It's, it's separated from the vine and it will die, dry up, and it's no good but to be thrown to the fire. So to be united to Christ, we must be attached to him. And we're attached to him when we're attached to his holy Catholic Church of tradition. Because the conciliar church is not, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing of Catholicism really in it. It has the veneer of Catholicism, but the new mass undermines the sacrifice. The new mass has washed, watered down everything Catholic. The new mass is poisonous and erodes the soul. Archbishop Lefebvre said the new mass is poison, it's evil, it does not give grace. That's what he said many times. It doesn't give grace. <clears throat> and Father Pulvermacher used to say, what's the proof of that? Look at the fruits of the new Mass. Empty seminaries, empty convents, <coughs> the loss of faith, the irreverence to the Blessed Sacrament. And that means even the new Mass said in Latin facing the altar, because some priests do this, say the new mass in Latin facing the altar, and it's still poisonous, because the, ri the rite itself, the missile itself, is compromised, it's poison. So that's liberal Catholics of today, and then the liberal Catholics of yesteryear were those who believed in separation of church and state, that modern democracy is a great thing. Now, the, the Catholic Church does not condemn democracy, but she condemns modern democracy. What is modern democracy? It is based on a few errors. One, that all authority comes not from God, but from the people. That's condemned by the church. That's modern democracy. So the people are the will of God. So if, and the, the majority, if the majority vote goes for abortion or for euthanasia, or organ donation of vital organs, which is, they have to murder the person to get the organs. If 90% of the people vote for it, then, well, the majority rules in a, in a modern democracy, because the voice of the people is the voice of God, which is completely irrational, let alone condemned by natural law and by God. So truth is in numbers with modern democracy. So Pope Pius X severely condemned modern democracy. And, but what is the true Catholic understanding of democracy? It is the people may elect their leader, but always understood that the authority comes from God. And that truth is not in numbers. Truth stands on its own. So... Um, I am the vine, <clears throat> you are the branches. And what gives us life in our soul is union with Christ, first by the profession of the Catholic faith, of tradition. Secondly, living in the state of grace, that is, obedient to his commandments. And obedience to his laws, the laws of his commandments, the laws of the church. So the sap of the vine and the branches is sanctifying grace. That's what gives life to the soul. And you can't taste the presence of God in you. You can't see it. You can sense it. And St. Thomas Aquinas also says you can't even know if one is in, truly in the state of grace. We can't really know for sure. And St. Paul says that. I, I do not judge myself. And think of St. Joan of Arc when she was kept in prison. She was, poor thing, was brutally brought to interrogation after interrogation after interrogation. And one of the priests asked her, are you in the state of grace? And her answer was so theologically sound. She said, if, I'm, if I am not, if I'm not in the state of grace, may God put me there. And if I am, may he keep me there. 
St. Thomas Aquinas says, What are the signs that one may be in the state of grace, for sure? Is one, you've confessed all mortal sins and you're sorry for them. That's a very obvious objective sign. And that's why it's very good you're going to make the general confession. Just clean off all the old slate and begin again. A beautiful gift of God to begin again, which only Catholicism gives. And <clears throat> the sign that one is in the state of grace is they have, they delight in spending company with God. They delight in the presence of God. So when they're before, for example, the Blessed Sacrament, it's a joy to be adoring our Lord. It's, it's not painful and looking at our watch and let's get out of here. I'm, 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 I'm uncomfortable. The sign that one's in the state of grace is they take a delight in living with God. And then given by St. Louis de Montfort, a sign that one is in the state of grace and will save their soul is a, a great devotion to the most blessed Virgin Mary. <clears throat> That's a sign of salvation. And she gave us the scapular as a sign of your predestination. That whoever dies wearing the scapular will not suffer eternal fire. What a gift from Our Lady. And then the five for Saturdays, a tremendous gift of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That if you just do them, you promise you won't die in mortal sin. You're going to save your soul. So I won't ask who has not done them here. I hope if I did, there'd be no hands. <laughs> now, what do you do if you don't have the Mass? Like in our crisis now, you don't have a Resistance Mass to go to. You don't have the Latin Mass to go to. Especially on First Saturdays, what do you do? Well, you make a spiritual communion. The five requirements for the First Saturdays are very easy. One, you say the rosary, which we do every day anyway. Two, you go to confession on that day or eight days before or after. And if you don't have the sacrament of confession nearby to a traditional priest, then you make a perfect act of contrition as best you can. Our Lord knows and he sees. And then, third, you receive communion on that day. If you don't have Mass, you make a spiritual communion. Fourth, 15 minutes meditation on the mysteries of our Lord and Our Lady's life in the Rosary. 15 minutes, which is really nothing. You're doing 20 minutes several times a day. And then the last is that you intentionally deliberately do it in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In reparation to her. You fulfill these five for Saturdays. It's, a, it's like a guarantee. It doesn't mean we can go back and live and, and com commit mortal sins carelessly and because we would be mocking God. But God and Our Lady promise all the graces to save your soul if you do these. And then the nine first Fridays of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. This is e even less conditions. All you got to do is receive communion on the first Friday and make a confession eight days before or after or on that day. Again, if you don't have Mass, you can make a spiritual confession. Spiritual confession, that is a perfect act of contrition and a spiritual communion. <clears throat> Now, some people are a little shocked when they hear this. You know, you, what, how, how would the spiritual communion even compare to a real communion? There's no comparison. But for God, there's... Some people go to physical communion at the communion rail and receive our Lord with less attention and love and devotion than those who might be miles away but long to receive Him and make a spiritual communion. They, those at home are far away from the Mass, making a spiritual communion, could receive much more grace than the one who actually receives physical communion. So our Lord can give His grace as He wishes. And there's such a, there is a Catholic teaching called Baptism of Desire, Baptism of Repentance. It's a true Catholic teaching by St. Ambrose, St. Bernard, the Council of Trent, 
<clears throat> the Fenites deny baptism of desire and blood, but it's, it's just foolish. Why? Because our Lord says, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So you got two. You need the water and the Holy Ghost. If, if death cuts someone short from being baptized with water, like the good thief on the cross, and many other saints who were not baptized with water, but they had the baptism of desire, they had the baptism of repentance, they can receive sanctifying grace. And Archbishop Lefebvre says in, in Africa, and we priests do this all the time, Father, I want to become Catholic. Well, can I be baptized right now? Well, we've got to make sure you, you want to become Catholic and you understand the basics of the faith. So the priest will put them through catechism instructions, sometimes for a month, two months, three months, whatever it takes for him to get the basics. He doesn't have to be a Joe theologian, but he has to know the basics. So if baptism of desire was not a teaching of the church, it would be sinful for us to delay baptism. But the practice of the church is based on sound doctrine, which is make sure they have a sufficient knowledge, then they can be baptized. But what happens if someone wants to be baptized with water? <coughs> he's studying the catechism. He wants to become Catholic, but he's driving on the way to see Father to get another instruction, and he's killed in a car crash. The Catholic Church teaches God can infuse in his soul sanctifying grace by baptism of desire, baptism of repentance, St. Thomas Aquinas calls it. So, so this union with Christ by St. Divine Grace, this union is what's called the mystical body of Christ, the Catholic Church. I am the head, you are the, I am the vine, you are the branches. Christ is the invisible head of the Catholic Church. The visible head is the Pope. And the Pope is not the successor of Christ. He's the vicar of Christ. And the Pope's duty is to hand down what Christ gave to his church. He's not allowed to invent new doctrines. He's not allowed to make a new mass. He's not allowed to teach er errors and heresies. And if he does, then we tell them, you have a right to our disobedience because you're, you're disobeying all of tradition which is what Archbishop Lefebvre had to tell Pope Paul VI. You want me to accept Vatican II? You want me to accept the new Mass? But all this goes against all of your predecessors. So either I obey you and disobey all the popes of tradition, or I obey them and disobey you. And I choose to disobey you than to disobey all of Catholic tradition. And he's right. And that's going on right now with Bishop Vigano. And he's, he's right. And if a pope or a bishop invent a new doctrine or change the faith, they don't have the right to do that. That's defined by Vatican I, that the Holy Ghost is given to the popes not to invent new doctrine, not to change it, moder modernize it, but to hand it down. That's what tr tradition is, the handing down I have, I have handed down what I received, says St. Paul. And Archbishop Lefebvre had that, those words on his tomb. I have handed down what I received. <coughs> so the mystical body of Christ is the union of Christ, the head, with his body, the church. And we make up members of his body. St. Paul says, don't you know you are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh? If you hit or harm someone, a member of the church, you harm Christ. St. Augustine uses the great example of St. Paul. Remember, St. Paul never met our Lord. He met St. Peter, but he didn't meet Christ himself until he was knocked off his horse. Then Christ appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So what strange words, because St. Paul never saw Christ. 
So why is our Lord saying, why do you persecute me? If someone steps on your toe, you say, get off of me. And Christ, in a way, was saying to St. Paul, get off my toes, meaning stop persecuting me through my members of the Catholic Church. And that shows the close union with Christ that we have. So it's really a, a, an intimate union. And the depth of it, the, the intimacy, is with sanctifying grace. There are four effects of sanctifying grace according to the traditional catechism. First, it gives us a participation in the very life of the Blessed Trinity. So in a way, you have the blood transfusion of Christ's precious blood in your veins. And St. Leo the Great, on Christmas night, in, Saint, in the Lateran Basilica, there's a famous sermon he gave as Pope. And he said, Recognize, O Christians, your dignity, that you are made partakers of the very Trinity. So don't go back. Don't go backwards and fall back to the sins of your former life. So that's the true dignity of man, is sanctifying grace, and to profess the Catholic faith. And that's why, as Catholics, we want to bring all into the true church. We want to bring all to lo love our Lord. That's the apostolic spirit. And we want souls to be saved. Outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. That's true. St. Peter makes that point in his epistle when he says, all those outside of Noah's Ark, they all drowned in the flood. All of them drowned. Everyone drowned. And only those in the ship, which was eight people, survived. So, <clears throat> the first effect of St. Divine Grace is we actually share in the very life of God. So is this, what's this participation? What kind of, what union is this? Is this a union in our essential being? Do we actually, like the one-worlders and the Buddhists and some of these New Agers say, that we are God? Or are we just like the, the Quakers and Ben Franklin, a deist, the deists used to teach that God is, has nothing to do with us. He just, it's like winding up an old clock. He puts it down and walks away. He has no care, no love for us in this world. So you got those two extremes. Those who say pantheism, we are God and everything is God. The other extreme is God creates the world and us and has, wants nothing to do with us. Those are the two extremes of error, both condemned by the church. What is the Catholic truth? <clears throat> it is God gives us to share in his divine life and it is, it's an accidental union but touches into the very being of our soul so that your soul really does shine brighter than the sun, whiter than snow by sanctifying grace. So St. Teresa of Avila, our Lord showed her her soul in the state of grace. And she thought, Lord, this is, is this an angel? Is this some part of heaven? It's so beautiful. And our Lord said to her, Teresa, that's your soul, because I dwell there. So only in heaven we'll see the actual beauty of the soul by sanctifying grace. But the beauty of the soul can shine through the body in many ways. The peace, the kindness of the face. Most Catholics uh, who are striving to live according to God's law and grace, and there's a, a, a pleasantness to their features. And even if they're deformed, they're still smiling, there's still something, something bright in them. And that's the union with God by sanctifying grace. And people who live in mortal sin, there is a true darkness and pagans pick that up in Catholics. They, they realize there's just something different about them. They pick it up. And it's a scandal when Catholics try to be one with the world and get drunk with the world and talk dirty like the world. 
But pagans know there's something wrong here. Often the priests who preach the retreats, many priests have said, especially when you get first-time retreatants, and a big, a big bunch of them, um, who are coming from a heavy life of sin, many priests have said, you can see on the face during the retreat, you can see the face is, is heavy, especially with the heavy meditations, you know, hell and death and judgment. <laughs> That's a lot of heavy reality. But after the general confession, the faces are beaming. There's a glow. There's a, there's a certain joy deep in them. And that's St. Divine Grace. <coughs> so it shows. St. Paul would say to the early Catholics, you are our epistles. Our epistles are not just on paper. You are the epistle. You are the Catholic epistle. You are the Catholic catechism. You are the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We're supposed to live that love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary. People should see that in us, in our words, our actions, our thoughts, our, our charity, and our defense of the faith. Because sometimes you have to appear, you have to appear mean and backward and rigid, which is the famous favorite word of Pope Francis and Benedict. Rigid traditional Catholics. Well, rigid because you don't want to break the laws of God. And you don't want to go to your friend's or daughter or son's wedding before a non-Catholic minister. So in that, you have to say, no, I can't participate in that. Oh, we're having a huge celebration on Sunday. And either you miss Mass or you go to the celebration. But you can't do both. Obviously, you have to put God first. Obviously. In Post Falls, many years ago, in the 90s, the, the Post Falls had a good hockey team. A really good hockey team. And, and uh, Vince Hughes built up the rink. And it's, it's right now, it's really doing well. He had Wayne Gretzky come and do summer camps. He was a famous hockey player that played for Edmonton Oilers. And... Um, And the Post Falls hockey team, every year at the state championship, which was in Boise, which is about three and a half hours south, they would go Friday, play the games, and beat everybody. Saturday, play the games, beat everybody. Sunday was the final championship. They were most likely going to win, but they all had to drive back to be at Mass for Sunday. So year after year after year, they missed the championship game which is the correct thing. And God blessed them for that because finally the Boise Hockey League said, look, this, they're devoted to their Sunday Mass. Why don't we just adapt to put the tournament on Saturday? So they did. And it would have, made it, it would have been much easier if they just sent a priest to say Mass for them. But anyway, they didn't do that. But anyway, uh, they ended up having the tournament on Saturday and, of course... They beat everybody and won the cha state championship. And that's the right thing to do. Here in St. Mary's, Father Grego, when he was pastor prior, he did a very correct thing, which the liberals just tear their hair out when they hear it. But the football team at St. Mary's, which is pretty good, the high school team, they had a game and there were girls on the other team. And Father Grego said, we're not going to, we can't play this game. We're not going to play football with girls because you can hurt them, you can break their bones, and it's not their place. It's just not their place. So the St. Mary's team uh, forfeited the game, and that hit the newspapers, and all the liberals went screaming. But Father Grego did the right thing. You don't mistreat girls. And the seminarians, we used to play sometimes hockey with the college kids in, in Winona on the free times on Fridays and Sundays. And one girl came out, so at the time, Jason Huvar, the seminarian, he said, well, if she's going to play with the men, she's going to play with the men and get treated like them. So he, <laughs> he checked her against the boards, and she, you know, was crawling off the ice. 
He shouldn't have done that, maybe, but he taught a lesson. You don't play a man's game. And that's true. So there is a difference between men and women. And the modern world wants to, wants to completely erase the differences, even biological differences, which is just common sense. Now they got gender bathrooms. Did you see that in Kansas City Airport? They got an all-gender bathroom. I was about to walk in looking for where's the men and where's... And it's all gender. I'm not stepping in there. But this is the sick lies of the liberals pushing on, on, on the people. Women have a, a role that even the devils are jealous of. <clears throat> because the devils cannot create new people, new beings, and new angels. But women participate with God, the Blessed Trinity, in bringing children into the world and filling heaven. It's an incredible thing, the role of the woman. So the, the Freemasons back in the 1800s, they said in their meetings, to destroy the Catholic Church, we have to destroy the woman first. Get her in male attire, get her to want to be like men, or on the other side, super loose like prostitutes. So our poor girls today, you know, the poor girls today, I have a lot of pity on them because the world presents them two avenues. One, you become loose and pro prostitute dress and behavior, or masculine, and start getting uh, <clears throat> you know buzz cuts and tattoos and have a pack of Marlboro into your T-shirt and wearing blue jeans and acting like a man. And it's gross. You've seen women that try to be manly. It's gross. And any normal man is like, whoa, get away. This is not normal it's not part of the natural law but that's the lies of the modern world the liberals want to destroy the women that's why if the enemies of christ to destroy the church wanted to destroy the women to build up the church a big part of it is bring back the beauty of feminine nature bring back the, the beautiful role of the woman which is on the very practical level, motherhood and, and womanhood, and to dress like a woman, not like a man. And the highest, of course, is the consecrated nuns, to give their life to Christ, to be married to Christ. It's very powerful in the world when people see nuns with full habits. <laughs> and nobody says no to these nuns. Just, they just You can't say no to them. That's why the bishop in Seattle, when St. Francis Xavier Cabrini would visit him and ask, we need money for the hospital, we need money to start the school. One time he was hiding under his desk because <laughs> he knew he can't say no to this beautiful, humble, charitable Italian nun. And he was hiding under his desk. So the secretary had to, well, he's not here today. And she walked in and said, Your Excellency, oh, oh, sorry, sister, I was picking up my pencil. <laughs> so, the power of nuns, may we see them again, convents, nursing nuns, teaching nuns, contemplative nuns, so important to bring all this back. And married people... When they see priests in cassock and they see the nuns in full habit, it helps the married people. It's like looking up to the mountains and you see the example to be faithful to your vows. So if nuns and priests and monks are faithful to their vows, it's like a lighthouse for all the world to see. It helps married people be faithful to their vows. And it helps keep people in line. Men watch their mouth when two sisters in full habit walk in. <laughs> they do that to priests, too, when we come to the prison. All right, Fred, watch your language. The priest is here. Father, he needs a big confession. It'll take him all day. But, you know, this... The power of consecrated souls. And the devil knew that... And our, uh, sister, uh, sister Lucia Fatima said the devil is... In 1957... The devil is making the last battle. He's, he's waging the last war on the church. 
And he knows that if he tears down priests and bishops and nuns, he brings many to hell. So he has especially attacked the consecrated souls. So that's why in the U.S. and in Canada and in Europe, they brought in these retreats, Vatican II retreats, and told the, the, the young girls and the young brothers and young seminarians, you have to experience the world, you have to experience what it's like to go dating, you have to experience all this so you can know how to help people. Well, you tell that to a bunch of young guys, and they, do, they put away the cross, well, they didn't come back. They went to the world and started dating and got in married. They abandoned their vocations. And they're just a really wretched, these Navasoto retreats that ruined the, the clergy and the nuns. There was a very holy nun in Quebec called Sister John Bosco. She told me that she had to flee early in the morning out of her bedroom through the window because they were going to take her that day to get recycled, to go undergo, uh, undergo retreats, to tell them, you know, you have to adapt to the modern world, you have to change your habit, you have to begin the new teaching, do away with the old catechism, bring in the new catechism, and she wouldn't have a part of it. So she, she jumped out of her window, Someone, some friends picked her up, and she joined with Archbishop Lefebvre's priests. That was in the 80s in Quebec. So, so the second effect of sanctifying grace is it makes us temples of the Holy Ghost. In the Old Testament, Solomon built a magnificent temple. It took him over 40 years. And when he was finished, God came down in the form of a cloud and filled the whole temple with a cloud. And he sat on the Holy of Holies, which was divided by the veil, a 60-foot high veil, which was ripped at Christ's death on the cross, showing the death of the Jewish religion. But in the, Old Test in the Old Testament temple in Jerusalem, God made himself manifest in a cloud. But even that is not cl even close to what we have by sanctifying grace, which is the indwelling of the whole Trinity in our soul and the very presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. It's quite incredible, the love of God. So we are really temples of God. And St. Lucy, when she was about to be martyred, she was questioned by the prefect. And one of the answers she gave is, the Holy Ghost dwells in us. We who profess Christ in the Catholic faith, the Holy Ghost dwells in us. Third <coughs> effect of sanctifying grace it makes us adopted children of God. So when parents adopt a child, and it's a laudable thing, it's a great thing, and now they make it extremely difficult. You have to pay a lot of money, go through a lot of hoops, a lot of red tape to adopt a child. It's diabolic. While to just kill a baby, you just have to pay a few dollars, walk in, and they're ready to kill it. Kill it. And now they go to hospitals in Texas and other parts of the country with with late-term abortions, which means bigger knives, bigger tubes, bigger sinks. It's horrifying. There was one plumber called in to an abortion Planned Parenthood in Buffalo, a lady, a, a lawyer, who's a lady lawyer in Buffalo who, who's very pro-life and active in it. She told me this, that the, uh, <coughs> the plumber came he was called in to unplug the sink in the Planned Parenthood. So he went downstairs and he, he uh, got his tools ready and he looked at what was clogging it. Pardon me, ladies, for saying this, but I'm just... But he saw little hair, feet, fingers floating on the water. It was all body parts of aborted babies. He said, I'm having nothing to do with this. He walked out of there. God bless him. So horrifying. Um, so when you adopt a child, on legal papers, on documents, they take your name, 
the name of the family, they become one with the family and they'll share in the inheritance, they'll share in the family meals and festivals and events. They're just like the family, but they really will, they never really share the same blood. They don't really share the blood of the family. It's a fiction. But with God, by, he makes us adopted sons and daughters by sanctifying grace. So that it's not just, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic. Remember, Christian was always Catholic up until 1517 with Luther. And uh, we have to say, I'm Catholic, to distinguish from the false Christians who, steal, who stole the name Christian. But we have that name, sons of God, children of God. We profess the Catholic faith. We are Catholic. But it's more than a fiction on a document. You actually share in the very divine life of the Trinity. So he gives you a blood transfusion into his own life. It's hard. We cannot comprehend this. Even in heaven we won't comprehend this. But in heaven you'll see much more clearly the love of God for the souls and how he gives us to share in his divine life because the soul will shine with the presence of grace in the soul and a soul not in the state of grace is dark, it's black and it's, it's in darkness <coughs> the souls in hell will be forever in that darkness and then lastly the fourth effect of sanctifying grace it gives us a right to go to heaven. So if you die in the state of grace, you're going to go to heaven. If we don't die in the state of grace, we won't go to heaven. It's, it's, that's where it comes down to. That's what it comes down to. That's why St. Divine Grace, this doctrine of the church, is so important. And you don't hear too much about it, actually. But it's extremely beautiful. And we need to live this and know it. So that if you die in the state of grace, you will go to heaven. Even if you have to pass through the kiln in purgatory, you're going to go home. St. Louis IX, he said, I have treasure more the church of my baptism than the cathedral where I was crowned a king. I value more the church of my baptism because the cathedral where I was crowned king gives me gives me dominion over uh, the country but baptism gives me the passport to go to heaven and he understood that so you know in the mass when we kneel down at the creed at, at, at verbum caro factum est and in the last gospel at verbum caro factum est you know when we bow genuflect guess who started that trend <laughs> it was St. Louis the Ninth. So people would see him at Mass with his wife and the family because they'd be closer to the altar. And that's what he started doing. So people just started imitating him. And now it affected the whole church. So we still do it, thanks to St. Louis IX. So we understood that baptism gives us St. Divine Grace, which is the passport to heaven. We have a certain right to go to heaven. That's why the same divine grace is so precious. That's why it's so important that we foster this and treasure this and deepen the union with God by love in union with Him. And it's very important to teach this to the children, the value of sanctifying grace. You know, why do I have to dress modest? Well, because you're a temple of the Blessed Trinity. That's why. You have to dress according to the dignity God gave you. So, in the Navasoto Church, when they brought in the new mass, many of them brought in bulldozers and sledgehammers to smash the altar. Father Kimball's brother, in the 70s, was invited by the local priest to come and renovate the church. So he arrived, and was, they were, the boys, the altar boys, were given sledgehammers to smash the marble altar. Of course, he wouldn't have part of it. 
But the smashing of the altars, the smashing of the communion rails, and replaced by the table, that is very significant of what mortal sin is in the soul. We smash the altar on the soul of the, of the, of the Christ present in the soul. So in, in, in each of us, There's a drawing of a person. Um, in each of us, the heart is the altar which we love God with and we offer sacrifices to God of our daily duties of state, the crosses of daily life, the splinters of daily life. That's the heart is like the altar in us. And on this altar, we offer the sacrifices of our daily sanctification. The mind, says St. Ephraim, is like the thurible, which offers the incense of adoration to God. Our mind is like a thurible, burning incense uh, of acts of love of God, gratitude to God, adoration, reparation. Very important that we do this. And St. Francis de Sales um, puts a lot of emphasis on this to those he, he directs in the spiritual life. How important it is to make throughout the day acts of adoration, gratitude, reparation, and love of God. And the angel taught this to the children of Fatima, that beautiful prayer, My God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love thee. And I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love thee. And she also taught the children, when you make a sacrifice, say, O oh my Jesus, it is for the love of thee, for the conversion of sinners, for the Holy Father, and in reparation for the sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's what we should say. Very easy. Teach the children this. And the children of Fatima, they understood. They saw hell. They saw Our Lady. They saw the light of God. And they had a crash course retreat. And they offered many sacrifices. They would give up sometimes their desserts, feed it to the, or the, even their lunch, feed it to the sheep. And they also picked up a cord, a rope, <coughs> and cut it between the three of them and put it around their waist as a penance. And it's a, you know, a rough cord, it itches. Nobody knew but Our Lady. But Our Lady did tell them. She didn't say, oh, that's extreme, don't do that. She didn't. She said, take it off at night. A mother's touch. Take it off at night so at least you sleep well. Isn't that something? So, uh, the heart is the altar, the mind is the incense, and our body and soul is the sacrifice to God. And it's, it's very real when you're consecrated to God, as a priest, a monk, or a nun, or a brother. You're actually consecrated to God. Everything you are is His. <coughs> And the priest, his whole being is another Christ. His whole being is it's filled with the oil, Christus. Chrism is the root word for Christus in Greek. And in the Old Testament, the priests, the priest, when they were anointed, the high priest would pour oil over his head and it would drip down his face, down his beard, down his bare chest and shoulders down to his legs. And he was anointed this way. So Christ is the anointed Christus by the divine person. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, God the Son became man, assumed the human nature, and drenched the human nature in the divine person, like oil dripping and soaking in all his body. So that every action and thought of Christ was divine. Every step, every word, every drop of sweat in St. Joseph's workshop, every blister walking through the deserts was the divine person called theandric actions in theology. So we, the priest, is the closest union to Christ, which we're not worthy of. It's a frightful dignity, but that's what the priest is. 
So happy you if you have children who will be priests. And when you're buried, mothers, when you're buried, the priest, the cloth that wraps around his hand when he's ordained, and his hands are anointed with the sacred oils, that cloth that goes around his hands is wrapped around the mother's hands at her burial. That's a Catholic custom. Very beautiful. And St. John Bosco, his mother, Margarita, Mama Margarita, <laughs> she's a great woman because she was kind of hoping to retire. All the kids are raised now, grown up. But then St. John Bosco comes on vacation at home and says, Mom, why don't you be the mother of all my boys? You mean all these orphans, these wild boys? Yes, you can do the laundry, the cooking. And Are you serious? She accepted it, and she became Mama Margarita, the, the mother of all these boys. And it wasn't easy, because, you know, boys, they would run through all the, the garden, playing football and kicking the ball, and run over the carrots. And she would say to her son, St. John Bosco, they're out of control, you've got to control these boys. Oh, don't worry, Mom, as long as they're not sinning. <laughs> so, not that St. John Bosco, you know, let them be wild, wild, but he, he said, play, run, and scream at recreation, but don't sin. One time, St. John Bosco took in some boys, had pity on them off the streets, but they were just thugs. And they took off in the middle of the night, taking the bedding, the sheets, the pillows, some clothes, they stole it. And Mama Margarita was very upset, but St. John Bosco told her, this is the price of charity. Sometimes you get an honest one, sometimes you get deceivers. So imagine being in her shoes, and she's a saint, Mama Margarita. So, <clears throat> so all this just to say that this doctrine of the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity fulfills what Christ said. We will come and make our abode in you. There's several places where God speaks in the plural. Let us make man according to our image. That's the Trinity speaking. It's a plural. It's not let me make man according to my image. It's the three persons of the Trinity speaking. And we have the reflection of the Trinity in us even naturally by intelligence, memory, and will. Intelligence reflects God the Father, memory reflects God the Son, and will to love reflects the Holy Ghost in us. And that reflection is still on the souls in hell, but they, they spread mud over it. They, they defiled it, the temple of God. And then when sanctifying grace is in the soul, it's elevated much more, so that you actually have all the fruits of the Holy Ghost, 12 of them, the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, the three theological virtues, the five, the five um, uh, intellectual virtues, they're called, and the four moral virtues. That's all in us with sanctifying grace. And everything you do in the state of grace merits for heaven. And that's why we ought to offer everything we do out of love for God. Everything. Everything, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God, says St. Paul. And everything, even your sleep. St. Gertrude used to say, Lord, I can't love you and think of you in the night because I'm in la-la land when I'm sleeping. But I want to offer you every breath, every heartbeat, as if it was a real act of love for you, that I was fully awake. And our Lord took it like that. He really accepted it. So he will do that if we... We can't be more generous than him, not even close. But if we give everything to his glory, he accepts it all. Like a mother, you know, little Johnny, who's three, he goes out to the backyard and pulls out a weed, a dandelion weed. Actually, they're actually pretty healthy plants for the liver and all that. But he brings mom a weed. Here, mom, here's a flower. And the mother acts like, oh, that's so beautiful. How nice of you. She doesn't scold him. She accepts the flower because it's his, an, an offering of his love for his mother. 
You know, you, you must have kids who do that. <laughs> and the mother accepts it as if it was a bouquet of roses. So God, he knows we are nothing. He knows what we offer is peanuts and toothpicks. But if we do it out of love for him and our Blessed Mother, he takes it as a mother takes a weed from her son. So one time the Mother of God appeared to three girls, <clears throat> three ladies who lived, sisters, they lived in the same house. The priest gave them all a penance, prayed the rosary every day for a year. That's quite a penance, but anyway, they accepted it, and they did it. So every, at the end of the year, the Virgin Mary appeared to the three, and to the one she appeared beautiful and shining, and clothed in beautiful dress with gold gilled and shining, and flowers. And Our Lady said, I want to thank you, because this is how you clothed me with your rosary every day. Then she appeared to the second one, <laughs> And it was a simple white veil, but no gold and no flowers, not shining. She said the rosary more distractedly and less attention. But Our Lady said, I want to come and thank you, because this is how you clothed me. And then she appeared to the third lady, and she dressed in rags. Our Lady was all dressed in rags, with holes and dirt. And she said, I come to thank you, this is how you dressed me. And she was horrified and said, what happened? I closed you like that? What do you mean? Because when you prayed the rosary, you didn't, pray really, you didn't really pray. You were distracted and thought of many other things but your soul and the love of God. So we've got to rem remember these details. Every Hail Mary is like a rose given to Our Lady, which will never wither in heaven. That's the power of all that we do on earth to merit for heaven. And it is powerful. And this is a beautiful Catholic doctrine that you and I, we can merit for the glory of God, merit for heaven. God wants us to participate in our salvation. As St. Augustine says, He who created you without you will not save you without you. He who created us without us, he, he's, he said the words and we were made, He won't save us without our cooperation. We have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We have to work out being watchful and pray and keep my commandments if you love me and abide in me and I in you, what the Sacred Heart says. Live in me and I will live in you so that I live in you, you live in me, we're one. It's closer a union than between any husband and wife. That can only go so far on the physical side and in the heart, they, they, they love each other tenderly, and they, you know, there's a union there, two in one flesh. But the two in one flesh with Christ is closer, because we actually, he lives in us and we in him, the blessed trinity. So it's a true union of love. And that's how we're supposed to live, by the love of God, and our lo love our, of our neighbor, obviously, because Christ died for each soul. So we should have compassion on our neighbor, especially when we see them like pagans in the world who don't obey or love God. We have to pray to help save souls from hell, which is what Our Lady asked us at Fatima to do. So, all right, we'll take a, a little break, and then there'll be lunch really soon. We'll close with that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell, and all souls to heaven, especially those most in need. Sorrowful and Mary, Saint Mary, St. Joseph, St. Anthony, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.